This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. As new evidence emerges over the pivotal role of psychologists in the CIA's torture program, we're joined by one of the nation's best-known psychiatrists, Robert J. Lifton. For the past five decades, he's written extensively on the psychological dimensions of war, from the U.S. atomic bombing of Hiroshima to doctors who aided Nazi crimes to nuclear war. In 1967, Robert J. Lifton won a National Book Award for his work, Death in Life, Survivors of Hiroshima. In 1970, he would testify before a Senate committee about the Vietnam War. He warned about the need to help rehumanize returning veterans into society. He said the veteran, quote, returns as a tainted intruder, likely to seek continuing outlets for a pattern of violence to which they have become habituated. In 1986, he published the seminal book, The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide. Last night, Robert J. Lifton spoke here in New York at the Penn World Voices Festival about another genocide, the Armenian Genocide of 1915 and Turkish efforts to rewrite history. For decades, Robert J. Lifton has also been a leading critic of nuclear weapons and more recently has focused on the global threat posed by climate change. Last year, he wrote a piece in The New York Times comparing the nuclear freeze movement of the 1980s to the climate justice movement of today. He wrote, quote, "...people came to feel that it was deeply wrong, perhaps evil, to engage in nuclear war, and are coming to an awareness that it is deeply wrong, perhaps evil, to destroy our habitat and create a legacy of suffering for our children and grandchildren." Unquote. Well, today, Robert J. Lifton joins us in our studio to talk about these and other issues. We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Dr. Lifton. Happy to be back with it's you. It's very good to have you with us. The issue of climate change, um, the issue that you are now uh, focusing on today, a psychiatrist focusing on climate change. Why climate change? Climate change uh, is an all-enveloping issue. Nobody can completely deal with it. It's everything around us. One can approach it from different perspectives. And because I've done so much work on nuclear threat, this seemed to me to be uh, a baseline from which to compare climate change. So in my work on climate change, I bring to bear the psychological approach that I use with nuclear weapons and make comparisons, looking for both parallels and differences. And I've been doing that now for the last few years. And what exactly, Dr. Lifton, what are the parallels that you draw uh, between uh, uh, opposition to uh, nuclear weapons and the climate justice movement today? The parallel that's all important is that both really involve the destruction of the human habitat. So I call the work mind and habitat. Habitat is that part of nature which we require to really keep going uh, as a human species. And mind is what we're given in an evolutionary way. It's the hope that we have for combating climate change and the nuclear threat as well. Uh, they both bring forth apocalyptic images of destroying the entire human habitat and interfering with the future of the human race. Uh, they also have a common origin. It's not fully appreciated how much the whole climate movement evolved from the anti-nuclear movement. For instance, um, Greenpeace civil disobedience at sea began as an anti-nuclear movement, and some of the early voyages on which later actions were modeled were voyages by people like Earl Reynolds uh, into nuclear test areas. So there's a relationship in their origins. Uh, yet they're very different. They're, they're not the same, because nuclear weapons involve these things, these devices that are genocidal in their dimensions. Uh, and uh, climate change involves the environment that we live in on a daily basis and that has been created with threat of altering the temperature 
uh, from the time of industrialization for a few hundred years. They differ in that incremental side to climate change, but they basically resemble each other in the totality of the threat to the human habitat. We've been covering the divestment movement across the country and really around the world. Last month, Democracy Now! spoke to Talia Rothstein, a sophomore at Harvard College and coordinator of Divest Harvard. She'd been participating in a blockade of uh, Maine Administration Hall throughout Harvard Heat Week and explained why the students decided to take action on climate change. Uh, Our campaign started a few years ago um, to try to open up conversation with Harvard about the impact of its investments in the fossil fuel industry. Um, we've been uh, repeatedly uh, refused open dialogue um, of the kind we feel this issue deserves um, and uh, ostracized by the Harvard administration. Um, they refused to engage on this issue. Um, for a few years, we attempted to create a space for dialogue um, and inevitably had to um, uh, resort to civil disobedience to put as much public pressure on the Harvard administration as possible. So um, last spring, we blockaded the office of the president um, as well, and a student was arrested after a day and a half. Uh, a few months ago, we occupied Massachusetts Hall um, for 24 hours and, again, uh, received uh, no uh, significant consideration of the issue. And so this week, um, called Harvard Heat Week, we're assembling all the constituents of the movement, students, faculty, alumni, community members. Um, um, to show the broad uh, base of support, the range of diverse voices that support this movement, um, and to make sure that the Harvard administration can no longer ignore this issue of climate justice. That's Talia Rothstein, who is a sophomore at Harvard College and a coordinator of Divest Harvard, participating in Harvard Heat Week. Now, Dr. Robert J. Lifton, you taught at Harvard Medical School for years, and you went up for this week? I did. Uh, close friends of mine are involved in the divestment movement at Harvard which I think is extremely important, and that was an admirable statement by a student uh, who have uh, behaved in this whole process very steadily and uh, wisely and strongly. Divestment is a movement that has enormous power because it contributes uh, an ethical dimension to the whole climate issue. There are a couple of CEOs of fossil fuel groups who are beginning to say, I don't want students of the future to look critically upon our corporation uh, because we use fossil fuels. Uh, the divestment movement is gathering strength, and it has to be looked at not just in terms of what it uh, denies the fossil fuels corporations. We're not about to bankrupt them but rather what it says in connection with mounting a climate movement which is taking shape. It's part of what I call the climate swerve, meaning a whole tendency toward increased awareness of truths about climate threat. And the divestment movement is right at the heart of it, very admirable. So you're talking about you're changing the moral climate. Um, just in our headlines today, I'm wondering your response to Bank of America announcing it's cutting off financing to companies involved in coal mining. Um, the CEO of um, Corporate Social Responsibility, um, uh, it says, speaking at an annual shareholders meeting, Corporate Social Responsibility Executive Andrew Plepler said the firm will, quote, reduce our credit exposure over time to the coal mining sector globally, uh, the move coming under a new policy that says, quote, as one of the world's largest financial institutions, the bank has a responsibility to help mitigate climate change by leveraging our scale and resources to accelerate the transition from a high-carbon to a low-carbon society. That's an enormously important uh, event, because it shows uh, that right at the heart of society, the corporations that have been so complicit uh, in, develop in, in increasing the danger from fossil fuels are recognizing First, the ethical uh, absurdity of continuing to support fossil fuels, but also a certain commonality. You know, the, the, foss the uh, large American financial institutions will suffer like the rest of us from climate change because it's an all-enveloping threat. 
This reminds me, incidentally, it seems uh, something different, but when I was active in the physicians' anti-nuclear movement, we met internationally with the Soviet delegation, and late at night, somebody would give a toast, either a Russian or an American doctor. Uh, it sounded better with a Russian accent, but the toast was always the same, and the toast was, I drink to you and your health, and the health of your leaders, and the health of your people. Because if you die, we die. If you survive, we survive. Hmm. So the pragmatic is converted or combined with the ethical in uh, recognizing that we're all in this together. Well, Dr. Lifter, when you were working on, on nuclear weapons, on opposition to nuclear weapons, you talked about the gap between the actual threat posed by nuclear weapons and the mind's perception of that threat. Do you see something comparable happening on, uh, on climate change? Yes. Uh, that's an important issue for me. Uh, climate change has suffered. Uh, the movement against climate change has suffered from uh, a lack of awareness because it's surround it's our surround uh you know it's the normality of what we live in uh if unaltered uh leading us toward catastrophe increasingly there has been a change in awareness it's what i call a change from fragmented to formed awareness that is instead of just vague images about climate change we're now developing a narrative, a recognition of what it is, what causes it, what causes it, what we might do about it, so that the gap which we suffered from and still exists is lessening as we come to a closer awareness of what really uh, confronts us with climate change. That's the hopeful dimension. I want to turn to remarks made by Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, uh, the chair of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. He used a snowball as a prop during the, uh, his Senate address in an attempt to refute uh, that human beings have anything to do with global warming. This is a clip. When we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record. I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball. And that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. So there he is. There's Senator James Inhofe, head of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, throwing a snowball in this, on the Senate floor, uh, saying this disproves global warming. When Senator Inhofe brought that snowball into the Senate, he was uh, a figure of ridiculousness. That is, uh, the climate swerve I mentioned, the increased awareness, has, in a way, isolated the direct deniers. It's true that much of the Republican Party refuses to say overtly that climate change is a real threat, but uh, they're becoming increasingly uh, uh, weaker in their claim. The denial of climate change is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Senator, in Inhofe uh, is no longer a threat in terms of what he says. The polls all show that the country is moving toward recognition that climate change is real and that it's a threat to us. The real danger with climate change is what I call climate normality. There was nuclear normality. We tried to domesticate the weapons. There was the infamous living with nuclear weapons, which came right out of the Kennedy School at Harvard. With climate change, the normality is built into the whole world structure. And the difficulty is breaking through that normality and recognizing how uh, the way we live in an ordinary routine threatens the whole human future. We're talking to Robert J. Lifton, leading American psychologist, psychiatrist, author of many books, distinguished professor emeritus of psychiatry and psychology at the City University of New York. He is the recipient of numerous national and international awards and honorary degrees. Among his books, Death and Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, for which he won the National Book Award, Nazi Doctors, Medical Killing and the Psychology of Genocide. When we come back, we're going to talk about the 
investigation into the American Psycholo Psychological Association, the largest association of psychologists in the world, their relationship <clears throat> with torture at Guantanamo, at Abu Ghraib. Stay with us.